every city basically was a star city. It had these stars around them, but they were all walled, but also somatic shapes. These are the moats we're told, right? Because we're all taught that the castles were, and, you know, were these square buildings with a moat. But when we can see them from above, there's these intricate somatic patterns. And clearly you can see why we call them star forts, because they look like stars. So here's one in Portugal, one of the star forts, the huge amount of terraforming around it. Amazingly, this one is still in pretty much pristine condition compared to the destruction of most of the ones you find today. Piano notes. As you can see, these are all cymatic. A, A sharp, B, C, and they're all these cymatic shapes. These are cathedral windows, this line here. These are, you know, rose windows or rolling cathedrals. And these are cymatic patterns, which are, which are created through um, frequency, so either harmonics or intention. Down here we have, this is our DNA, so these are fractals or cymatic patterns of our DNA. This is this is what we get when it's when it's good intention. We get these perfect, you know, geometrical shapes, and when it's bad intention, we get this goop. So this is like a polluted river, and this is like a clean river. And so if we tie this back to the cathedrals who, that have got these windows and they're connected to the ether with all these spires and then what else do we have in cathedrals but these things called organs right and we have these things called organs in our body and we just the dna you know um cymatic is the same as as some frequencies in these windows so what this is all looking like is these are these are you know, healing healing factories or, or not even healing wellness i guess just to keep people well they're pumping out they're pumping out frequencies you can literally google any city of, of the old world from the 1600s and back and it will come up in these star fort shapes and every single one is like venice and there's canals everywhere those are the highways of the time but they were also so so much more with all of like this hidden technology infrastructure and buried history and you can see this one again all of these big cathedrals in the in the cities but here's one of the the stars right or batteries attached into the wall and there's even another one one of these more sort of um irregular shaped ones out here but they always have these stars attached you know to these star cities and again the canals and you know you can see this is a big iron kind of thing as well but the thing is with water water's free energy you know you float a boat you use the current, right? The you current. Can have the water wheel. What do I want to do? Water wheel, the power. Electricity just as much as it was the physical power and mechanical power that they used out of it. What's to say that windmills and water wheels weren't actually generating hydroelectric and wind power a few hundred, five hundred years ago? This is a, a drawing. This is um, New York City, right? Um, Battery Park is because this is what was there a battery hello 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 how are we all <coughs> everyone oh, and Bernie oh, here thank Bernie you for is here. hanging around and waiting for us and ben is here and campbell is here we're ben from all over analog and he is doing his first stream so make sure you all go across and subscribe he now has a youtube channel um and it's called waking up with analog and um, we are live on it right now Ooh, uh, six likes right now we're actually streaming on 16 platforms as as we speak so that well, that is what took so long it was one heck of a ridiculous setup but it's true we are live on 16 different accounts right now uh we are on uh, five YouTube channels. That is Autodidactic uh, channel number one, Crypto Alchemist. My second, Burn Eye, Mind Third Eye, Science Guy. The third, We Hijacked Andreas Sirtis's. Uh Hopefully, Andreas uh, is able to join us in time. And we are live on Ben's Waking Up with Analog channel. And the first, yeah, and your also first Facebook. Live. Twitter, Odyssey, Rumble, and Twitch. We're everywhere, man. Right? Like three Rumbles, two Odysseys, two Twitters, a Twitch. 
It's ridiculous. It's it's the Malsi stream. It's a whole new age. So welcome to everyone in chat. Um, hope you're doing fine and dandy. 184 of you across um, those however many channels it was is. And of course, we um yeah, our special guest tonight is Ben. And so we're going to be delving into some um some giant um oh, giant yeah. stuff from the past. Um, if you haven't seen Ben before, he uh, looks into old newspaper clippings, which is, you know, we're, we're, you know, that's something that they can't change, right? And back in the day, newspapers were actually had journalists, right? And journalists actually had journals. They actually went out and and talked to people and wrote things in their journals and got stories. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of good stuff um, in in the past in the in all the newspaper records. So welcome, Ben. Yeah, say thanks. hello to the good audience. To be, yeah, the papers are great. Yeah, it's been a lot of years inside of them. I know them pretty well now. I, I bet all that microfish and microfilm, and I mean, you must. I was thinking about it just before. Like, like how long does it take you to find like an article? Do you literally have to go through newspapers, or are there ways to search like articles within newspapers, or or, or do you um, just sit there? And I use all kinds of different. Um, sites and different apps um on my phone the only one i really use is uh library of congress because their mobile coding is really good um but a lot of the state ran archives are horrible on your phone like you can't see everything and you can't zoom in properly it's just really buggy but on if you're on a desktop um i always recommend using state um about a year and a half ago, I did a whole, I went through every state archive I could get into because eventually I'm going to do a series where I do a state and do a video on a state and all the things I found. And certain states have different um, programs and some are really, really good. Like you can search very specific, like how many words <clears throat> in between whatever it is you're looking for, if it's just in the title, if you know dates and oh, times wow. and um yeah, they're all different but yeah um um keyword search is huge obviously that saves me a lot of time yeah um, i was gonna say it but like when i'm looking for something specific from like a date you know like i spent i spent probably two or three hundred hours reading all the papers around 1811 and 1812 the new new madrid event um and that just involves reading just about every paper you can find. Um, I did the same thing during 1942. Uh, I went through a phase where I was pretty obsessed with the Philadelphia experiment. And I was looking at all the other Tesla type uh, EM experiments that they were running at the time, radium experiments. So that involved just kind of a lot of like scientific jargon. So it really just depends on what you're trying to do. But yeah, you spend enough time, you can you get pretty efficient at it. Yeah. But somebody who wants to just use it on their phone casually, I would say Library of the Con Library of Congress is probably one of the best. Um, but if you really want to go deep, you you got to just start accessing every state one because they're all different. Like I can search a, a, a phrase on Library of Congress, and if I go on a state archive and search the same phrase, you're going to get completely different things. So they're not; they are different. They don't have a lot of overlap, so it can be a little spotty. So yeah, you got to cross your T's. But yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, yeah, and it's good too. You know, you're bringing out a lot of stuff that, you know, we just don't know. Right? It's hidden history, isn't it? You know, like completely. Yes. But it's, but it's 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 evidence based. It's factual. You like literally people talking about all this stuff. Yeah, the way the way um, the way people wrote, especially the news or whatever you want to call it, you know, 150, 200 years ago was very different than it is now. And just due to the sheer size and difficulties of control and, you know, electronics has made it much easier to control things. And you can have, um, you know, you have such a thick uh, level of bureaucracy that, you know, just getting a building permit can take years. So you can imagine if you on you finally get your building permit and then you hit, you know, an ancient ship or a pile of bones. I mean, you're basically screwed. And, you know, yeah, there's a there's five people that you have to call 
and then they all have to come out in person. Whereas in the 1800s, you, <laughs> farmers were plowing their fields and digging up unbelievable things all the time. I mean, this was an, a regular occurrence. Um, you know, I use the phrase, we stand on the shoulder of giants all the time, and it's absolutely true. Not just caves, but burials, mounds, um, people just scattered. You know, in Tennessee, they found a graveyard of dwarfs, and they found over 100,000 bodies. Whoa. So, I mean, we go. Thousand. Yeah. What? 100, mm -hmm. And so, yeah. what happens to all that? Does that just get like turned into fertilizer or something? Like, what do they do with it all? I always use the, the Indiana so, Jones reference, you know, where the art of right? the Smithsonian. Yeah, that is absolutely from a historical standpoint, what was happening. And, and they uh, must have a crap load of stuff. Oh, you, I mean, it's underground because we're talking endless amounts of square footage would be required to store these artifacts. Mm. So I can't imagine it being in, in an actual building. I'm sure some of it is, and some of, some of it are in museums. Um, I've talked and I've talked quite lengthy about um, that. I believe, the majority of of what we call Egypt of the East is a fraud, and in the 1800s, they the Smithsonian verbatim was stealing artifacts against the will of the governors of the states and the regions, and were sending them to the East and to to museums in Europe. Um, wow. The oldest mummies and, in the world and the largest quantity of mummies come from North and South America and Mexico. Um, it's not even close. I mean, in Mexico, I have articles where they found um, tombs in the mountains that had over a thousand mummies. Same in Colorado, um, stuff like that all over. And yeah, they're much uh -huh. older and with um, texts that you would, you know, prescribed to the Egypt as we think of it today, but from America, you know, Egyptian, Assyrian, Coptic, you know, all of these quote mm. um it's different languages quick, of the it? East. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, and I, I think, postulated thank you, thanks, Waffle House too for your kind donation. Um yes, so I mean that's what's coming out. Obviously um Dr. Longo, Old World Florida is doing a lot of work on this, but so you're saying basically they were finding all these Egyptian-esque artifacts and in America and, and mummies and things and then sending them to Egypt, what we call Egypt today, and setting them up as the history there. Basically. Well, that, yeah, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of good videos done by a bunch of different channels that have shown in the um, early nineteen hundreds where they were constructing a lot of these Egyptian um, monuments that we know today there were plenty of of old um tombs and all these things in egypt um and i'm not saying that all of them are not legit i'm just saying a lot of what has been uh propped up as archaeological tourism is a yeah. is a fraud or at least it's been plastered over and the true history of it has been manipulated or changed or edited um whereas in america and again, why I love the old newspapers, um, you can really see the the breaking ground, so to say, of these finds and what was happening. And the majority of them, the majority of them, 90%, it's the, they call them Sonian. And again, because of, you know, we're dealing with such a, a date where, you know, it could take a month or longer to get an agent out there. You, you didn't have all this um, bureaucracy lockdown. So you had the people who would find it and then they would explore it and then they would charge all their neighbors to come look at it and they'd be making money yeah. off of it until the Smithsonian showed up. Well, yeah, there's that famous story of that um, giant that the two brothers found and they ended up putting him in um, formaldehyde or something and took him around to all the fairs for a year and there's still photos of him. But of course, Man, now it's... There are a few of those, hopes, right? right? Like yeah, there the are circuses would have like all the giants, all the Sasquatch, all of the different uh, mummies, anything that was from that old world left over. They would then tour them and display them, like, and that's why it would be the freak show because it's freak like mm -hmm. they would always be exponentially more than uh, what we're led to believe. Yeah, sorry, some some of those were frauds. Um, 
you know, and I like to sh- I like to share the ones that are frauds too, just because it's interesting as well. But I've at this point I've found so well, many that it, I, I, yeah, the it's thing beyond about reasonable is, doubt that it's all hmm, it's all and frauds um, have to be based on something, don't they? Yeah, like pretty much normally, like like it's yeah, like the fraud wouldn't come first; it'd be the originals, and then people trying to rip them off because they can say they can make money from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's absolutely. There they were there were. Mm-hmm. There were people that wanted to make money, you know, they found it on their land. You know, I've, I'm a big lover of caves and I've found, you know, hundreds of caves. Some of them are absolutely beyond belief. And, you know, in these times, they own the land, you own the cave and mm-hmm. they were charging, you know, five cents for people to come and take tours. And so you have such a wealth of what I would, in my opinion, is honest information before so, it gets turned into a national park and the majority of it is closed off. That's what happened with some of these gigantic cave systems, or most of them. They either yeah. are still in private hands, which I would say is now the government, or they were turned into a um, national park and 90% of the cave is now off limits due to safety yeah. concerns. But the reality is it's not about safety. It's about no, it's, whatever it's lies beyond safety. Yeah. yeah because... Well, this is what Paul's finding out, you know, like all these things he's finding are all blocked up and bricked up. And he even did, went to a few, filmed them and put it up and then went back and, and they'd since been blocked up. Like people had gone in and obviously seen his video and gone, oh, crap, and gone back and bricked them in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and you – you know, some of these are like straight out of fantasy novels. You know, they're, well, they're walking they, they, into caves mm. that are, you know, some of the caves are, there is a cave in the Ozark Mountains that went on for 300 miles. 300. Correct. Wow. And there are other ones that they postulate go thousands of miles that they did. The ones remember. that connect from like the tip of South America all the way up through Central America. And they say it goes to the tip of North America mm-hmm. and vice versa under the seas. And uh, the ones from uh, like the UK to Egypt and all over the place. Yeah. There were, mm. there were writers in the 1800s that were postulating that there are multiple underground rivers and underground oceans that are wholly navigable by ships. And again, I've found articles where they find whole ships underground, whole ships connected with subterranean lakes. In Washington, they found a cave that went on for 15 miles. They found a giant underground ocean and their, their light couldn't light up the ceiling or the sides of the wall was so vast. And at the, uh, shore of this underground lake were two petrified giant boats, both 30 feet long. And they resembled what they called um, Viking schooner type ships, you know, which is again, you know, Phoenician or Etruscan or Mediterranean style. But and then they it's found. So, they, go ahead. Do these waterways connect with above ground or are these boats, would they have had to have been fully built underground? Built underground. They do not connect. No, they're the caves, wow. the cave entrances connect to the surface, not the water. <clears throat> At not least, the water, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they weren't able to navigate. They, they built their own boat on this one in Washington and they mapped out 18 plus miles and, um, it got too much temperature fluctuation. You find a lot of these caves, they're either incredibly cold or they're incredibly hot. Sometimes it's right in the middle, but sometimes it's they become ice caves. Um, there was a cave in my home state that they found in the 1800s, and they called it the Great Ice Cave. And it, they were shipping ice all over the whole Pacific Northwest, all the way to California, because it was so large, huge, they never reached the end of it. And it was producing such incredible was, large amounts of perfect ice, high. perfectly clear ice. They also talked about... Um, the stream, the, the the underground streams in this area, the water was so pure and healthy Hi, that it was curing it was curing people. It was you know healing streams. So, so like yeah. prime water kind of stuff. Exactly. You find, um, yeah. I mean, it's endless. Again, I have I have hundreds and hundreds of these on my uh, Twitter page for those who don't who don't know or don't follow me. And uh, well, and let's pretty- share, please share your Twitter right now. Uh, you can present it and 
loaded um, up. Good bet. Well, from Stellium. And Stellium. And Stellium. Yes, welcome, Mike from Mike, Stellium Mike, Mike, 7. Mike, Mike, Mike. Guys. And also, I see I see Bernie's been telling everyone to subscribe to his channel, but don't do that. Subscribe to my channel because I need eleven people yes. to hit seventy five thousand. Sorry, and I've been also, trying to hit that for like three months, man. Eleven <laughs> people. I'm gonna do them all. I'm gonna do them all. Just <laughs> I, mean, uh, I was I was uh, <laughs> shilling the shit out of mine because uh, there's more people currently on waking up with analog. Uh, 26 oh, really? on uh, Ben's for his first channel, and on my Burn Eye one, uh, there it was 21 uh, when I did that. All so, uh, but yes, also definitely subscribe to Autodidactic One. He needs 11 new subscribers to make 75,000. I just need 11 people. If I'm you get out of public, right tell the person next to you to get their phone out, show them the channel, get them to subscribe. And Stellium, uh, did you still have the YouTube on in the background by chance, or are we getting yeah. some sort of reverb? We are getting a, a little bit of a doctor, aren't we? Oh, sorry, I, I meant to. Oh, oh he's got to yes. plug in. Good to plug in. Um, so before we went live, you you had you were talk, you told me a bit of a theory on Star Force, Ben, um, on what you think they might be. Um, yeah, um, I've talked about this before, but yeah, um, all the star forts are connected with water. I mean, not all of them, but most of them, some are built up in the mountains and they're connected by ways of, you know, streams or wells or, you know, they're connected to the same source as a lot of these rivers. If they're not on the river or on the ocean and, um, over all the years of just my own studies, um, I've kind of come to the conclusion that I agree predominantly with what Edgar Casey was saying about um, Atlantis and this advanced culture that cover the globe. And I would, I would correlate star forts with the same culture um, because they talk about a very similar tech. Casey does the you know, crystals, sound, cymatics, um, magnetism and water being the predominant um, intermediary between all of those things. And obviously, you know, mm -hmm. they were a great, um, merchant class, merchant society. And, um, when you cover the globe, you find, um, as I was reading to you off air, the concept of this whole Venice, you know, that all of these ancient cities were like Venice and the oldest Venice type cultures you find here, um, in middle america venezuela is named after venice um tino titlan mexico city was called the original venice <clears throat> all of florida was called venice tampa bay was venice. called venice yeah, right. um, all over the philippines cities they called venice um but yeah um these cities built on pil piles or pylons um a class of people living on the ocean on the water um yeah right man madol's like that but it's sort of underwater now yeah um, and, you, and in the earliest um can, just using the papers the newspapers as a as a reference because that's my niche um they were shooting down the narrative of them being anything to do with um military in the 1800s oh, they were that, that some of the indians had moved into them they were abandoned at this point and it had been for I would I would assume 100 200 sometimes more than that 3 4 500 years they'd been abandoned and they some of the natives there had moved into them um, and all of the ones that I've found um, articles for all said they were connected with with huge amounts of underground water and that they had tunnels um, some of the ones on the Mississippi and yes there were star forts all over the Mississippi They've been completely dismantled or were buried in some event, probably the New Madrid event. Um, mm. All of uh, New York, Philadelphia area was covered in star forts. Basically, all of the major waterways of Eastern America were covered in star forts. And they were all connected by underground tunnels, in my opinion. I have scriptural proof of that, textual proof, sorry. Mm. But I theorize that they were all connected like this. 
And um, in these tunnels, they found that they connected with mounds. So star forts were connected with mounds. And um, what people have to understand is not all mounds are burial mounds. Some of them are actual pyramidal um, structures. Yeah. Um, mm. And um, Native American cultures of Mexico and the southwest of America described um, mounds or pyramids as arcs. So their story of Noah's Ark was that it was a pyramid, not a boat, and that they were entrances to the underground, and that's how they survived the floods, and that there were multiple floods, multiple events. Um, the Mayan have a cosmology of four resets, all by different elements, wind, air, fire, water, so forth, and you know, mud flood being one of them, fire being one of them, water being one of them, and that there's this incredible labyrinth that I think covers the world and why were people so inclined to build underground and go underground and you know the, mm. a lot of these old cultures they talk about their ancestral roots come from underground you know inner earth mm. yeah yeah the, the ant people and stuff it's always uh, you know it's always confused me you know when I came across places like Derenyaku and that and yeah. you know escaping floods it's like if like going underground is a bad idea, isn't it? When there's a flood. Um, I mean, if you're advanced enough to build some of these caves that yeah, I found, I guess they had like, yeah, they, if it was a cave, you can imagine that. Yeah. They'd have dry places and the water would kind of go down into the, into the. And, the and the they and sound. Stuff. So in a lot of these really advanced caves where we're mm -hmm. finding, you know, giants and tombs and living spaces and cities and running water, they find often find these really deep chasms that they sound to over 3000 feet. So I'd imagine drainage, for any yeah. kind of overflow and they're connected with underground streams so like know. peru right like uh, the nazca it goes all the way from the top of the mountains that they chiseled in and all the way under the desert to the ocean thousands of kilometers that they've done these and it's all over the world yeah and i talk about terraforming a lot and i think you're dealing with a culture that was building star forts in a very similar manner in a very similar construction all around the world on a scale that would be it would take you know hundreds of millions of people working non-stop for mm. hundreds of years to build on this okay. scale and then you exactly. loop, you loop into that that i postulate that if we were capable of that we were building whole continents whole whole you know continent might be a stretch but whole islands there are many islands that i believe were yeah. made we've shaped yeah. land we've you know you just look at brussels and Parts of Northern Europe where entire countries are literally shaped well, by Dan hand. Yeah, the Denmark, Netherlands. The Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes on and on. I mean, they're, it's endless, really. And all of Mexico City, I mean, when the Spanish got to Mexico City, they basically said it was the most beautiful city they'd ever seen in their lives, and they couldn't believe it. There's no way these people were building this, you know. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, was in and then they just built over the top of it. I actually just shared an article recently. Um, I found this old article. Um, they were doing excavations. They were, uh, there was an earthquake in Mexico, and they had to do some repair work on the main cathedral there in Mexico City. And um, one of the walls was damaged. And they started digging down, and they found a whole nother pyramid underneath the, wow. the, the uh, cathedral there. And they found huge tombs, hundreds of bodies. Um, yeah, it went on and on. So um again we stand on the shoulders of giants i mean there are cities like this all over italy constantinople sits on four different cities so when they were they were having to do water work were repairs on constantinople in the late 1800s and they dug down and found four different civilizations four different huge cities so you take a city like constantinople and you see how beautiful it is and how the, the, the monstrous sizes of some of these buildings the mosques there the churches and you think there's four different getting levels. big and like that on the way underneath down. a city that big and i think this is this is realm wide i wouldn't necessarily four but four seems to be kind of a magic number and it kind of ties in with what i was telling you about the mayan saying well, that the world the, the, yeah, the world yeah. reset four times mm. so yeah that was a roundabout way uh kind of a quick synopsis of what i think but but yeah an advanced culture that was building just about anything so i would say the majority of the major waterways of the world have been if not sculpted by man manipulated by man 
um, and Starport oh, play. Starports yeah, play a big part of that. Um, I found an mm. article from China. They were they were talking about this this canal builder who was a Mormon who had worked on the Erie Canal and came out west to help to help build canals, but really they were just digging out canals. And he was saying he was um he was he got into canal building because he read this old um what he called a myth, but I don't think it's a myth. This person in China became emperor because there was a flood and he built star forts and canals and trained the land. So the land had been completely covered in water and there was nowhere to start farming and so on and so forth. So this whole concept of a deluge and using these star forts and systems of drainage, in my opinion. So again, I'm how I said that star forts are multifaceted. I think, again, mm -hmm. they do play a part in not only um, power um, defense, um, drainage as well. You know, water flow is incredibly important, just like the Nile um, creating um, land suitable for farming is a is an advanced art. And when you need millions of acres to grow food for an incredibly large amount of people, I mean, they found a city in Arkansas so large that every major city of Europe could fit inside of it. They said all Paris, London could fit inside of it. And they estimated that it that there were at least 12 million people living within the boundaries of this city in Arkansas. So you can imagine how much food you would need to do this. And me and Stellium have spent a lot of time on Google earth and, um, you know, shout out 13th monkey as well. No one spent more time on Google earth than him. Mm -hmm. And the, the majority of the American Midwest is completely terraformed. All the farming is built into squares, one mile squares. Yes. And it's been laser etched into the ground. And um, this is advanced. It was there in the 1830s. It was already there. So, you know, we're horse and buggy, but we're building lit. We're, they we're talking about, you know, thousands of square miles. And they're cutting right. this grid so into the ground. The and leftover then, farming land. Yeah, oh, right. for sure. Leftover, 100%. And mechanical, showing the signs of the 3D printing, which I talk about a lot that we're dealing with, uh, you know, kind of a mathematical computer like construction of these systems. And that's nothing. Um, there's a canal or there's a uh, system of canals in Africa that it's unbelievably large. I mean, it could grow, it, it, it would grow enough food for like 10 billion people, just this one system in, in Africa. It's that monstrous. So yeah, I, I, I've, I postulated closer to, that the, closer the whole to 20, yeah, I postulated this whole realm was covered, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 billion people, probably. Who knows? You know, when you get the idea of scarcity and not enough land and not enough food and all these things are complete, complete farce. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, and the the best evidence is below our feet. You know, that's kind of what I've been trying to show. So, yeah, nice. before I ramble too much. <laughs> um, I only yes. have I only have about an hour before I have to get, All right. get my kids up for school, so I'm just going to jump. Right. Into one of my yeah, yeah. If you want to start sharing, yeah, yeah. Okay. Got anything you want to add there, Mike? While he's yeah, please. Ready? Uh, a couple of things. I was just thinking the grid lines that you mentioned, the one mile square. That a lot of those they look like they go under the mountains, so that's kind of far out. That uh, you know, it appears like the mountains came after. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> which, is, which is strange. Um, yeah, and that in that area that you were discussing in Africa, there's an article about it where a guy was looking at how much food can be produced per acre on average, and uh, he extrapolated that out based on how many uh, acres there were in that region, and he he estimated between five and ten billion. But Thirteenth Monkey and he he was looking deeper into that, and he found out that all the lines extended far far further than than this guy had. Uh, had realized when he when he made that article. So that's why I corrected and said probably closer to 20 billion could have been. And that's just a little tiny chunk. Billion. Of, uh, billion. Yeah. Billion. Uh -huh. No, billion. The 20 billion could have been fed by that little chunk of Africa. Uh, and that's just one continent, obviously. So I, I totally agree with what Ben said about manufactured scarcity. And, and uh, you know, we're living in it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've shared um, uh, on my pages as well that when they dig into some of these mounds and some of these cave systems, Campbell, 
they find ancient wheat and ancient corn. And they did a study in the 1800s where they planted some of this corn and wheat, Campbell. And it was 20 yeah. feet tall, some of this corn. What? And the lowest stock was 12 feet. The lowest stock of corn, ear, ear of corn, sorry, was 12 feet. And they grew to, uh, to 20 feet. Right. The Were they wheat, big seeds? The, Do you know? uh, they didn't describe the seeds, wow. the size of the seeds. But they called it mummy right. corn and mummy wheat because they often found it with mummies. Uh, the, the mummies would bury themselves with, you know, their, their prized possessions. That, that actually sounds kind of like the monoatomic giant lettuce I grew oh, yeah. uh, last summer. And, yeah, I'll, we're going to talk about that more on the next one when you have more yeah, time. So, shut up. So, 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 yeah, it, it does. It does. Because um, when they planted this corn and wheat, they said it looked unlike anything they'd ever seen. It, there was nothing like it left on Earth. And the ears of corn were like three times larger. Um, the the one stock of corn produced three times more in weight than the normal stock of corn. It had a dark, dark color, and it was completely drought resistant. They starved them of water, and they grew fine. They never even shriveled. So this is like, again, we're talking about advanced um, agriculture on an incredibly advanced level. Um, same thing with the wheat. The wheat was producing three to four times as much. And it was drought resistant, so on and so forth. So, I mean, this is we're talking about engineering, on yeah. A well, very GMO level, by yeah. People with the morals, right? GMO, but you know, not like we're for the good of the people, people. yeah, not yeah. by psychopaths. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's we could talk a whole show just about the <laughs> crops that they were growing with the yeah. seeds they were finding underground, and it's pretty amazing. But yeah, cool um, too. so this is an article from Arizona. Um, yeah, and I'll just get right into it. Uh, wonderful ethnological discovery, Ohio, 1871. Egyptian temples, ceremonies in Arizona. The Indians refused to go further. A vast black gulf opened down into the core of the earth, 2,000 feet below, 40 or 50 miles in width, enclosed in an unbroken, unscalable rim. Wonderful ethnological discovery, Egyptian temples, and ceremonies in Arizona. Remnants of a prehistoric race. So this is a long one, guys, so stick with me. In the New York world on Sunday, of Sunday, has a five-column letter from a correspondent at Santa Fe, which, if only half of it be true, will set all the ethnologic societies and literary bodies throughout Christendom agog with wonder and speculation. The letter purports to describe the adventures and discoveries of a certain plunky miner from the Rocky Mountains known as Mountain Jim, who in company with a man named Tim Jennings started for Denver last September in search for a mining in search of a mining country which would yield better fortune than to which they had been accustomed. Pushing forward day after day, meeting with constant disappointments in their hopes of finding paying loads, they at last found that they had gotten beyond the Colorado and Utah boundaries and had entered upon a country which wore so forbidding an aspect that even their Indian guides refused to accompany them further. It appears, however, that although the country furnished neither grass nor water nor any living thing save insects and reptiles, the devil-may-care spirit which frontier experience is apt to provoke still drove them forward. They had both sworn to go on until they found something, and on they went, alone, stumbling forward into a vast, arid waste in which they wandered for several days. They at last found themselves imprisoned in a desert, more malignant still. The upshot of it was that their mules died of starvation, and the agony of their thirst drove poor Jennings mad, and that in an, and that in an insane paroxysm he fell over a precipice and was dashed to pieces after enduring incalculable horrors mountain jim now utterly alone and stumbling on like a man in a dream suddenly perceived a black a vast black gulf that seemed to open down into the core of the earth and while yet he stood transfixed by terror the pulverized soil of the arid mesa sank under his feet and he slid down 2,000 feet into a valley in the midst of the desert, 40 or 50 miles in width, enclosed in an unscalable and unbroken vertical rim. The valley was the scene of his remarkable discoveries. Omitting his description of its beauty and verdure and heads of cattle 
we come to the point at which the real ethnological interest begins. He found that the valley abounded at intervals with the massive workmanship of human hands, invariably of stone, stone couches, stone statues, stone tanks for holding water, and huge stone roofs supported by great pillars of stone. Two stone causeways were also lined with a succession of stone houses extending as far as the eye could reach, none of which had any windows, while all had the expanded wings of a bird rudely chiseled over the doorway. No human being had yet seen, had, had yet been seen by our traveler, but while engaged in the outer examinations of one of those houses, a startling cry broke out. The cry was instantly responded to from both sides. Simultaneously, every doorway was animated with darting forms. In less than a minute, he says, says Harvey, both ridges were thick as anthills with people. I hardly knew what to make of the matter. At first, I lifted my hat and kept on the road. The farther I went, the more fuss they made. They were the most extraordinary people. The men were half naked. The women wore brilliant blue and red tunics, like hung over one shoulder and buttoned under the left arm and reaching down to the knees. The children hadn't a rag. Still, they didn't look like Indians or savages. Their complexion, a cross between the Indian and the mulatto. The women are wonderfully well-formed and good-looking. A great commotion ensued, but no attempts at violence. And pres presently, by science, our traveler began to parlay with them. The result of it, the result of it all being that he walked ahead of them, followed by a number of guards, and by the whole populace for a distance of several miles. When the party halted at a massive gate, which opened and let the hunter and his escort into a vast courtyard, half a mile square, surrounded by a stone wall. In the center of the court stood an edifice, an edifice which excited his utmost amazement and which his description would indicate was strongly, if not exactly, Egyptian in character. We quote, the enormous masses of stone of which it was composed and the majestic appearance of its construction were such as I had not previously been held. The front was adorned with a cornice and a frise covered with figures and hieroglyphics. A portico formed of 10 or 12 columns in three rows stood out from the front and the wings of the temple extended on each side. The shafts of the columns were covered by figures and hieroglyphics raised in bas relief. Prominent among these figures was one oft repeated of the head of a female with cow's ears, an unmistakable resemblance to the Egyptian sculptures of the goddess Isis. The front of the doorway leading into the interior and the walls architraves of the interior were excessively embellished with figures, emblems, and hieroglyphics, some of them such as a nature that they materially assisted him in his sub subsequent conclusion as to the history of these people. His description of a circular tracery upon the ceiling, though not minute and exact enough to satisfy, would answer for a general description of the drawing of the zodiac. He was subsequently confirmed, confined in a room as a prisoner and thus confined for two weeks. His captors, how, however, left untouched his revolver, which oversight was the probable means of his escape. One afternoon, to use his own language, he concluded to shoot off his pistol and see if he could wake, wake up the shop. He fired twice in succession, aiming at the ugliest priest on the wall. The effect was immediate and gratifying. The ponderous stone door sw swinging wide revealed a cluster of dismayed guards. Just charging the revolver again towards the ceiling, he seized the occasion to stride boldly forth with an air... <coughs> Excuse me, with an air and a look intended to convince his persecutors that he was no longer to be trifled with. Pushing on through a long hall down which the guards fled in terror, he passed into a vast apartment <clears throat> used as a sanctuary. Excuse me. <clears throat> there, the alarm given by the guards aroused a multitude of people prostrate on the floor. Here the spirit of deviltry induced him to fire his weapon again. The report produced fearful 
consternation. The crowd, evidently looking upon him as a supernatural being, parted right and left before him. Everybody did him reverence. Priestly, a young girl, whom be supposed to be the priestess, the princess, accosted him in alarm, an eloquent pantomime, in, entreating him to go away. With the assistance of a pencil and a thick stone slate, she explained that it was impossible to scale the barrier which surrounded the valley, but there was an uncertain river outlet to which he would be conveyed and a barge provided to enable him to make the attempt. Arrivingly after a two days journey at the point selected and embarking in a boat furnished for him, the gliding current bore him into a narrow and gigantic alley between walls and a naked rock, which gradually enclosed him in impenetrable darkness. He felt that he was passing through a subterraneous canyon. After several hours of intense suspense during the, which the current changed to a rapid and the rapid to a torrent, he reached the open light at the close of the next day, the habitations of the Yampas Indians at the head of the big canyon of the Colorado from which pace he found his way to Santa Fe. His theory, based partly on his own observations and partly on the little communication he had with the persons while in prison, is to say the effect that centuries ago, antedating back farther than the discovery of this continent by Columbus, by many centuries, a big encampment of migrating and high civilized race was nearly destroyed by the convulsions of an earthquake from the worst effects of which this now charming valley, together with a favored few men encamped therein, were, ex were exempt. The tumult and destruction of the event lifted the world around them into cyclopean ruins and left them isolated forever between enormous barriers of rock, surmounted by an inaccessible embankment in the flimsy soil which no foothold could obtain. Save thus by a miracle rechaining the religion and numerous enough to represent the arts of their race, shut out from the intercourse <clears throat> with the rest of the planet and impressed by the conviction that since no human form had ever seen and no human cry had ever been heard upon the verge above them, all humanity except themselves had perished. They and their descendants became possessed of an unchangeable fantasism, which, while forbidding progress, prevented retrogression, by continually impelling them to hold fast to the customs which the gods had sanctioned by the great tradition. That's it. Thanks for uh, sticking with me there. But yeah, long one. But yeah, so uh, an Egyptian city civilization found in below ground in the deserts of Arizona. Arizona. Yeah, right. and that, wow. right? Like that whole area, like. No wonder there's these legends and rumors of underground alien cities and underground dumbs, military bases and everything there now, because that entire area is essentially honeycomb <laughs> for with Futurama, the intro where they go in and then there's just city under city, under city, under city. Yeah. That's the Hopi prophecy, the four that have already happened and that we're going into the fifth age. I uh, also feel strongly with you on that one, Ben. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, for people that aren't familiar with my work, you know, a story like this is going to seem very much like fantasy. Mm. And that's fine. Again, I'm not going to say that this is, you know, obviously 100% provable, but I have countless articles on the Grand Canyon area, Arizona, Colorado, um, New Mexico, and Arizona, it was one of is is one of the most amazing places. Um, the canal systems in Arizona are hundreds and hundreds of miles, and we're not and we're talking incredibly advanced canals, incredibly advanced canals, not just dug out of the dirt. Um, and aquifers as well that are connected in between, right? Is that yeah, correct? some of the largest ruins ever found in the world. They found a um, a a building buried underground in Arizona that had a thousand rooms. So you don't hear anything about that anymore. Um, so, so you can did, only imagine. Did they do, you, sorry, did they do nuclear testing in Arizona? I'm just wondering what happened to this place. Like mo, uh, most of it, from my understanding, was uh, New Mexico, but they could have, for sure. Yeah, but um, I know seems they, a handy way to blow up these old cities, right? Well, I think. So this city is part of, in my opinion, 
um, what was covered up by dams. Um, oh, okay. The damming yeah, of rivers yeah. has covered hundreds of thousands. Well, of maybe miles that's worldwide. what's happening. Is it like what's the big lake in? Um, is it it's in Arizona, isn't it? On this drying up, is it Lake Mead? Yeah, yeah, that's in um, Nevada and Arizona, I believe. Yeah, didn't they just? I heard that they passed some law that you weren't allowed to film there or something anymore just recently. They were finding to too many dead bodies and different things coming up. And yeah, no doubt, or, as it goes too low, they don't want you filming because you're going to see the entrances to the underground uh, cities yeah. as well as the rooms of them. Mm, oh yeah, they, my, the, the Euphrates be a up. They found tons of what they're calling stone tombs, but they're not tombs. Entrances go, to underground places. Oh, okay. Turn them into air raid shelters. That's the yeah. standard thing. Yeah, I, I wouldn't go again. I, I I prefer. I mean, living underground obviously is for safety. Yeah, what the exact. Um, reason was, you know, giant creatures, um, plasma events, floods, who knows? I think it was probably multi multifaceted. One of the ruins um, they were excavating in Arizona, same thing. They went down three different layer layers of civilization, and each one of them had bared uh, markers of several things. One was volcanic. Um, one was um, flood. So I think oh, okay. it was many things. And, um, yeah, I don't know if we'll have time to get into this next one. Hopefully we will a, li a little bit. Um, this one's also from Arizona. And um, it kind of connects with what I was talking earlier about Edgar Casey and um, giants fighting giant animals. And, yeah, but that was a long read. This one's not as bad, but still. So if there's more uh, you want to talk about before I jump into this, definitely want to finish and touch on this one a little bit, but we could do I a just, whole I show. Just want to say, Go mm, ahead, Mike. I was just going to say real quick that, uh, you know, what we're seeing is the deeper down you go, the more megalithic, but also when you get down deepest, everything's blocked off. <laughs> right. I mean, we've seen that a lot with, with the stuff that, that mm. Paul has, has been showing. So mm. you go down deeper and deeper and everything gets bigger and then there's a stop and you don't go further than that. So, they're blocking something off. <laughs> mm. I was going to ask, like, have you found anything that talks about tech or anything that found in any of these places? Um, yeah, absolutely. Crystals. Um, it's not tech like you think. Yeah, I was going to say different it's kind of gemstones tech, yeah. and crystals, nice. and um, yeah, it's so many things. Um, mm. Advanced weaponry, but I, I don't necessarily. Um, I don't necessarily think it was weapons. You know, they often don't know how to describe things. They found staffs, you know, which is interesting. Um, mm. I think, again, when we talk about uh, a, a realm where a star fort provided um, some kind of um, advanced relationship with the environment and the people living in and around it. And for me, the, I keep going back to the ether um just like when you live in a humid place um you know long ago i've talked about this before the higher the humidity the higher the you know the ether the more conductive on an electrical scale and Absolutely. Oxygen, oxygen levels pay, play a big part in that and when we're talking about megafauna and giants you need you need a lot of things to be involved there and i think um you know paul good friend of mine um black sheep researcher with the flock tv i think he's uh, we have channel. a lot of overlays with yeah, uh, yeah paul i sent you the link if you want to join in what the flock and you better come this weekend during the 48 hour stream everybody here is invited i'm gonna shut yeah. up <laughs> so I, talk, you. I talk a lot about um spells and spelling and grammar and grimoires and yes yes um, yes the human potential of language and you know yep. ether ether or the quintessence um is the fifth element um yeah the highest um ranking in the secret societies of old was the level of q or the level of quintessence mm. and 
not only did the merchant class have this same high rank, but as did the priest class. And this is when magnetism was taught to the adept. You were high enough now that you were taught not only to use the mariner's compass, but the secrets of magnetism. And which is magic. Which is magic, exactly. And then not only that, it's 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 vernacular, it's 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 verb, it's your verbiage, it's what you speak into the ether, you know, um, ruha, numa, your breath, your sound, um, your ability to create good and bad wizards and warlocks. You know, I like to I always use the uh, Tolkien reference. I'm a big Tolkien guy. And the realms and worlds he were con was constructing in his stories, I believe, were absolutely our past. Have you have you looked into Tolkien at all? I've I've heard stories that he um, had access to old libraries of old books. Have you have you have you looked into him at all? Oh, I love Tolkien. I talk, I've talked about him endlessly. Um, again, Longo is a Tolkien guy, and um, I postulated that Middle America is Middle Earth of Tolkien, and there's a lot of overlays on his maps. Um, Tolkien had said before in private, again, you won't find an interview of this and confirming this is difficult, but he has said to people before that his stories were based on real events. And, um, if you want more of his insight, I recommend the Kalevala to anybody. If you haven't read it, it's fantastic. What um, was that one? The Kalevala. Kalevala? Yeah. It's uh, like a mythology, um, of Finnish mythology. So oh, is it Finnish? Oh, nice. If you guys no, like Lord perfect of the Rings, to to bring in. Yeah, you know the um, the beacons in Lord of the Rings. If you guys have seen it, that they light mm -hmm. uh, to bring. Yeah, yeah. So that is actually based on some beacons that are really near me. So there's one called Armada Beacon, and it's uh, it's at this location that's one of the highest areas in the area. So if we had a flood, it'd actually be the only safe space. And it's got a giant beacon up there that they used to light, you know, if an invasion came. But the thing is, it's in the middle of the country and it's, it's not exactly very useful for people. So it does make you wonder if it belonged to a different civilization rather than us. Because that's, you know, it's mid-Northwest, nowhere near the ocean or anything. And it was supposedly built, you know, uh, against French invasion and stuff like that. So it's, it's nuts. Yeah. Um, on previously yeah. previous talks, I've shared a lot of my um, giant wall articles. Uh, America was covered in walls like the Great Wall of China, um, Mexico, Peru. I think these walls went from South America all the way to Alaska, probably crossing the Bering Strait or what used to be the Bering Strait all the way around the world. Um, there's a Matt Damon movie. I can't remember the name of it off my head, off the top of my head, but it's about the Great Wall of China and them fighting. The, the Great Wall of China was built to fight off monsters, um, not men. Uh. And, oh, yeah, I know the movie. Yeah. Um, Let's go. Cool. So someone in chat, <laughs> I'm sure, Netflix. hopefully can help us out. Um, but yeah, um, <clears throat> Karimo, shout out Karimo. He's in my chat. Um, I posted a lot on the rock wall of texas michael cremo and the oh it was called oh, the great Cremo wall. Anu. oh yes yeah, yeah absolutely and I, I gotta email him for us to do one. Oh, um, yeah so they, they called so this chat. great wall of mississippi i'll just use this one um ancient historia since you're listening and you brought up the the uh, beacons they found a wall in uh, mississippi and they called it the brandy wine wall which cool. is lines up almost perfectly if you look at the Tolkien Middle Earth map and you line it up with America, which is a lot of great artists who have showed the overlays, the Brandywine River is on the Brandywine Wall on the Tolkien map almost perfectly. And this Mississippi Wall, this Mississippi Great Wall, they verbatim in the 1800s said this is a continuation of the Great Wall of China and compared its construction being very similar. And this rock wall in Texas... Why I bring this up is because the Mississippi wall, they they stole in in the newspapers, flat out said they stole all the stone from it to build the capitals. They were like, hey, we, we're building a new capital building. These stones are already pre-cut. This is perfect. And they just took just them off. Them. So this, this rock wall of Texas, yeah. um, it's incredibly important. Karimo has a video out on it. Uh, look it up. Rock wall of Texas. 
um, they broke down the molecular structure of this wall and found it contained dozens of different minerals, metals, and crystals. Metals that you that weren't even available in Texas, not even close, thousands of miles away. Like we're talking metals from the Congo, crystals from all around the world. So in this wall, um, again, connecting with the Casey stuff and, and my opinions of Atlantis, I believe this wall was was energized. It was some kind of device. Mm. I think Sounds all like these walls it. were like electric conduit. electrified. Yeah, they were mm. conduit walls. Um, they never reached the bottom of this wall. They stopped digging. They spent so much money and labor digging down. The wall kept getting bigger and bigger. The stones bigger and bigger. Like Stellium was saying, it get, everything gets bigger and Cyclopean just it gets larger and more advanced. The cement gets more advanced. They never reached the bottom of it. Um, but yeah, so there are walls encircling our entire world that have been buried by incredibly um, crazy events. Um, there are lava flows in California when they were doing mining. They found stone cities 400 feet below the surface, 400 feet of lava, and they find stone cities. And that's not the only one. They found stone cities underneath lava flows in Missouri, Tennessee, <coughs> all over America. So... We're talking some crazy, crazy events, you know, um, mm, did, unfathomable events, volcanoes, floods, mud floods. I mean, do you have multiple, any idea of time for when you'd think these would be? The events? I think there are mul multiple events. Um, there, again, I have a bunch of articles from Mexico. Um, same thing with Mexico, like I was talking about with Constantinople and Italy. Um, they dug down beneath some of these temples that we see, you know, that we talk about these pyramids in Mexico. Well, they're on top of another temple, on top oh, yeah. of another temple. They dug down four different la layers in, in Mexico. And at the bottom, they found Chinese hieroglyphics. The base of everything in, in Mexico is Chinese. And it's not Chinese as we think of it. It's a, it's a very ancient form of Chinese. They called it Chinese hieroglyphics because they believe the writing of China was based off of these symbols. So like the pre-dating and each, wow. each layer, some showed fire damage. Some showed people that were frozen in time, wow. like a plasma event. This is all over California, too, where people are like, um, kind of like Pompeii, but not exactly where they're huddled on the ground. We're talking people that are frozen in time, like still in their kitchen. Like they found a stone house in California. They called it the, the American Pompeii. They excavated a whole city and they found people literally frozen in place, like doing everyday chores, frozen in place. Wow. Now, for me, that that rings of a plasma event and the plasma event could cause all kinds of crazy things. So you could have, you know, people petrified in instantly and then, you know, starts kicking off volcanoes. Mud it could just be a million things. That's well, that, mm, uh, in England, sounds like my lot's wife, doesn't it? Turning to salt. I wonder if that's oh yeah, hundred percent. The salt thing for me is plasma. Yeah, yeah. talking mm. about plasma, that sounds like something that's been found in England. So uh, about forty years ago, they started doing tests, like dendrochronology tests, on all the trees, and they found that about fifteen hundred years ago, all the trees in Britain just died around the same time. So. Obviously, they, they started trying to figure out what this was, and they put it down to the 535 Krakatoa uh, explosion. But obviously, it's on the other side of the planet, and it didn't cause the same kind of stuff anywhere near. So people started thinking about what it could be, and this one historian found evidence of a comet. But thinking about a plasma ejection, it could be, it could be a similar thing, because the comet has seemingly flown over, and it's melted stone. We've got fortresses in Scotland that are vitrified on the top, going, you know, going down, so the atmosphere must have been thousands of degrees you know to, to melt this stone and then underneath i think it's saint paul's cathedral they actually found a person fused into the stone it was that hot a body had been fused uh -huh. into the stone. so obviously something's and that was buried deep beneath the uh, saint paul's cathedral along with a stone that was written in colburn that had a dragon on it and it said nobody knew what a dragon looked like yeah wow yeah I wonder they if have... that happened at 4:20. They have dragons uh, relics all over America. Well, um, yeah. th in fact, right. the only historical fossil of a dragon that I've ever found with all my time in the papers was found in Utah in a cave. It was 170 feet long, wings, and the guy. Wow. So they called they called a 
um, a specialist out, um, a fossil specialist, because it was found by uh, a person, you know, a miner. And um, I'll bring that up and I'll read that really quick before we touch on this article here. But they, um, the guy said that this is the only true dragon that he's ever, that anyone's ever found. And this true is in the dragon. 1800s. Yeah. So did, did that have like, was it, was it just a skeleton or did it have skin on it? that looked? No, no, it was it's... in a cave in Utah, in a cave so, right, well underground. Mm, it's just because we were talking before that, you know, these dragons and that could be, you know, bird, we know everything was bigger, you know, in the, in the vape canopy in the past. So they could literally be birds or bats maybe, you know, cause we've got the wing, but, um, you know, we get some pretty strange birds out there. So I'm just wondering if it was covered in feathers or if it was it had like, you know, skin like a bat. To be fair, going with all the dinosaur thing about how dinosaurs are supposed to have been feathered, I wouldn't be surprised if dragons also were way more feathered and actually looked like giant chickens. You know, oh, fight. they were feathered for sure. Um, yeah. Again, oh, okay. Um, all right. Well, I have, they, I... Literally, they could just be giant birds—a kind of giant bird. They could be, yeah. So again, I have, I cover a lot of topics on my posts, um, and giant prehistoric animals that were still alive is something that I'm very fascinated in. And um, they found a giant reptile in Alaska that had been terrorizing some of the Inuit, and um, they sent a hunting party to kill it. And the Duke of Westminster was traveling from England to be a part of this hunting party. So this is a well-known event. It sounds like and some King Kong shit, doesn't it? When, yeah, oh yeah. And um, they said it would cross the Bering Strait looking for food, and it lived underground in a cave. And there were people on the Russian side, this is the 1800s, that told the same story and had seen the same thing. It's Jurassic Park. And when they finally caught their first eye of it, it was carrying a caribou in its mouth, a full adult caribou, you know, 700, 800 pound caribou. And it was running up an ice wall. And uh, <clears throat> they never got it. But but they describe it being this giant a reptile covered in hair. <clears throat> or well, feathers. That sounds scary. <clears throat> um, you can just search beasts on my Twitter page and you'll find tons of articles. Um, there was a, a giant monster as big as uh, 10 elephants hunting pygmies. Uh, yeah crazy all over all over the world there were remnants of these things the smithsonian in the late 1800s put a bounty out for five million dollars for a dinosaur or what they called a giant lizard in the congo this is in public record it's on my twitter uh -huh. page so what's five million dollars in the 1800s today uh, a shitload like billion or something <laughs> yeah so that was what they were that's what they were that was the bounty on this lizard from the congo and they talked about all these different famous hunters who travel the world looking for big game. They were on their way there to collect on the wow. bounty. Because that, that's we've still got stories of that dinosaur, haven't we? What's it called? Mo, Mo something? They definitely um, accidentally released that. And they were like, hey, guys, uh, would anyone like to catch a definitely completely wild animal that we mm. haven't accidentally? <laughs> well, yeah, and it's interesting that we have all these stories of these no big game hunters, you know, but you know they say, "Oh no, it was just lions and you know zebras and stuff." But you know, who knows where did that all come from? And and of course, knights. And we have these strange pictures of swords with you know electricity coming out of them by the looks of it. To be fair, who the hell is answering the phone to a call like, "Hey, do you want to go hunt a giant monster?" And he's like, "Yes, I'll go there now." <laughs> I'll just go get my pith hat. Yes, I'm on. I'm on. I'm on my way. Now, this may, this may sound silly, but when you look into some of these presidents and a lot of these um, rich family people, this was a big thing. Traveling the world and hunting these rare monsters was well, Teddy very exclusive. Had Roosevelt, club. didn't he? Roosevelt, there were a lot of people. Mm. The people Roosevelt took with him, this was a big thing. You know, these, re these rich um, robber baron type people with lots of money and, you know, looking for something exciting. So since we talked about the dragon, I'll just read this article really quick. <clears throat> so this is uh, Pulse of Western Progress, Nebraska, 1894. 
bold discovery in Salina Canyon, Utah, causes a rush. Three miles of rich placer ground, hardships of the desert. A delirious wanderer rescued from his companion found in found in his last stumber, Northwest Moons. Prehistoric monster reptile. Up in the mountains about five miles west of this town is a curious formation in solid limestone consisting of a circular hole having a diameter of about three feet and an unknown depth, which has long been regarded as the center of a prehistoric geyser, says the Townsend Montana Messenger. Mr. J.P. Hardy, a well-known mining man, determined to explore it for the purpose of prospecting the rock for mineral. After descending about 80 feet in the passage, was found to be blocked by debris washed in from above, which after clearing, cleaning away disclosed the entrance to a vast underground cavern. As soon as he could accustom his sight to his surroundings, Mr. Hardy found himself in the midst of one of the grandest sights ever beheld by the eye of man. On every hand, stately columns, caused by the dripping of water through the limestone, rose from the floor in graceful form to meet a counterpart descending from the roof. A partial exploration of a few hundred yards brought him to what appeared to be a line of white barrel hoops standing upright and extending away into the darkness farther than his one candle would shed its rays. Judge of his astonishment to find, on examination, that he had discovered the petrified skeleton of an enormous reptile, perfect in every detail from head to tail. The bones of the head showed plainly that the monster was well equipped for aggressive warfare. Curved fangs, hinged to the upper jaw, 18 inches long, lay in place in what was once a huge mouth, which could open easily four feet. Judging from the articulation, the monster lay in a nearly straight line, and Mr. Handy found upon pacing it off that it measured upwards of 120 feet. About 50 feet from the head lay a number of bones which that appeared to belong to the skeleton and Mr. Hardy concluded were the wings. Further examination disclosed the presence of legs, though the only one though only one was in good condition. Judge Watson, who has read much of on prehistoric mammalian fossils, states that this is probably the only perfect specimen of a dragon in existence. The Smithsonian Institution has been informed of the find. Hmm. And we expect we'll have a representative here in a few days. Mr. Hardy refused one offer of $20,000 for his find and states that nothing short of $50,000 will purchase it. He has been trying to keep the discovery a secret in order to prepare for the rush that is sure to follow its announcement. But we are here to write up the news and our readers may look for more disclosure as the caverns are further explored. So, yeah. Pretty interesting. Yeah, Campbell's gone. Okay, I'm gonna st I'm gonna jump in for all the people here, and oh, since I'm getting, I'm still here. We're since still here. I was just okay. Myself. Yeah, sorry. No, no worries. Oh, no, you're no gonna worries. jump in and read it by all means. Yeah. Uh, yes, please do. Uh, so yeah, that was my dragon again for people that want to look into uh, more of the, my uh, um, articles. You can just add me on Twitter. You don't need Twitter. You can just look it up on the website. <clears throat> One underscore analog underscore nine. But if you have a Twitter account and you follow me, you can search my archive using the little magnifying glass, and you can just type in a keyword, beast, dragon, whatever, and you'll find some of this stuff, and you can read on it further. So, yeah. Just before this is you the last thing I read, this is about an excavation made in Arizona. Um, yeah, here we go. First inhabitants of America, giants in physique fought wild beasts in deadly combat 25,000 or 50,000 years ago. Warrior Emperor Tigrinus' tomb reveals that the first red-haired people in all history dwelt in America and that strange basket makers of prehistoric Utah were a kindred people to his tribe. Weird relics show powerful humans erected pyramids. Mummies of prehistoric Aztecs found in the ruins in New Mexico. Sorry, it's New Mexico indicate giant men built monuments far more ancient and greater than Egypt ever produced. New light cast on remarkable race. So this is a petrified basket. Um, they mummified turkeys, which is incredibly interesting. Another picture here. 
The cover of the pothole tomb of Tigrinus, shown above in coiled basketry like a merry widow hat, and then the mummy of the turkey. The first inhabitants of America, of which we have knowledge because of the extraordinary perfect mummies they left behind, are variously known as the basket makers and the spear throwers. They lived underground in the southwest, with their dead mummified in sealed potholes of chambers well below the surface. Their successors built cliff houses over them and either perished or moved along. Then on the top of these cliff houses came succeeding races who erected the more modern Pueblo of which the famous Mesa Verde constructed 5,000 years ago. I'm just going to read highlighted parts and touch on stuff because I'm getting low on time and it's a really big article. The strange feature is that each succeeding race built a village or a city on the ruins. So again, civilization built on another civilization built on another civilization more ancient than egypt naturally certain questions have ever since been puzzling archaeologists how did these strange people reach grand gulch and where did they come from he reasoned that they would only find basket maker remains and culture beneath other pueblos and his discoveries have proved his him correct in aztec new mexico he selected a great deserted city or pueblo of the usual sky scraper type of zuni new mexico here he began excavations and entered cellar tombs so ancient that they make Egypt, that they make ancient Egypt modern indeed. The chambers he opened were sealed not less than 25,000 years ago, and the mummies within were as well preserved as when placed therein. Two chambers are most interesting of the numerous recent discoveries in the Aztec ruin, an enormous prehistoric Pueblo community dwelling near Aztec, New Mexico. The pine and cedar beams are as are as round as when the trees were felled, and on the wall stones the marks of the quartzite pebbles with which they were faced are as bright and fresh as the artisan who shaped the blocks. This room was a tomb of a gigantic warrior emperor who lay in solitary state against one wall immediately back of the recessed altar in the painted room. The body was that of a veritable giant six feet four inches so again not like the giants we think of who towered head and shoulders above the average man of his tribe the mighty frame had wrapped in a mantle of feathered cloth and then shrouded with a mat of woven rush stems two battle axes back of the body there were four magnificent pottery bowls and a cup and a basket upon the skull rested a large spherical vase with a neatly fitting cover both exquisitely wrought and ornamented. Within easy grasp of the right hand were the wooden handles of two stone battle axes, and by them a half knife of quartzite, so a knife made out of quartz. A circular shield, three feet in diameter, unlike anything previously found in the Pueblo ruins, covered the warrior from thigh to temple. It is an example of coiled back, back coiled basketry technique the most primitive known but unusually thick and strong this is where it gets interesting the outer surface of this basket shield had been coated with gum and thickly spangled with flakes of mica when held in the sunlight due to the numberless reflecting surfaces the great disc would have shown with dazzling brilliance perhaps sufficiently intense to have confused the vision of the archers who sought to drive his arrow through the shield to the flesh behind it. Of 13 mummies found in an adjoining chamber, one was the most extraordinary which had come to light in the entire ruin. Ancient witch impelled. The shrunken body thus impelled presented a, spectac a spectacle so gruesome that at sight of it even the hardened excavators sh sh shuddered. It seemed probable that the old man, old woman, sorry, had fallen into disfavor in the village and had been perhaps a witch and had been subjected to this extraordinary and cruel form of torture and execution. So she was stabbed through the chest with a giant spear into the ground and left there to die. <clears throat> this gigantic warrior emperor of the basket makers, they named him Tigrinus. So that was just the name they gave him. Dr. Whistler informs me that we have had that we have here the actual founders of the Aztec and Benito culture, unless later excavations prove differently. Tigrinus must stand as the first emperor of the founders of the Aztec, who later 
whose later and wonderful structures adorned central Mexico in a line extending toward the Yucatan, and which extend eastward on the lost continent of Atlantis, the famed Atlantis of Plato. 250,000-year-old race, the basket makers of which the Emperor Tigrinus was a symbol, were a Titian or red-haired race. At least all their mummies so far brought to the American Museum have reddish wavy hair. If they were the founders of the Aztecs, the Aztecs must be assumed to have been the first Titian haired people on the earth of which we have knowledge. The hair color and the cross section show positively that these first Americans never migrated from Asia, a land of straight black haired people. So yeah, I'll stop there. But yeah, you get the idea. Um, Fucking giants everywhere. They find, yeah, they find, um, they find saber tooth, tiger bones. They find giant bear bones, rabbit skins, giant deer, giant horse um, bones. So they, they, they say that this guy was, the, you know, hunting gigantic animals. Wow! Giant everything from that time, and like there was giants, and then resets before that, there was titans and. The last mega apocalypse before that, they say everything was a megafauna, including humans. Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, I talk about Alaska a lot. Um, Alaska in the 1800s was an amazing place. The things they were finding there were absolutely mind blowing. Um, tropical cities. Um, there were whole regions of Alaska where the ground was still so warm from who knows water or volcanic activity or both that they called it a tropical paradise. Um, wild animals like from the Amazon parrots, like anything you could imagine, tropical fauna, giant fauna in Alaska. So these guys are stomping through st st snowy mountains and they come across this tropical paradise in the middle of, of a snowy world, um, with all kinds of tropical animals. Um, Alaska was completely tropical and not very long ago because we're looking at like one, two resets ago. They had mega, mega fauna, tropical fauna there. Um, off the coastline of Alaska, they have tons of ancient coral beds. Um, off the coast of Alaska, they found 26 pyramids. Uh, yeah. You can, you can well, go underwater. on. Underwater. Yeah. Underwater, correct. 26. We have coordinates for them. These are stuff we got to start investigating and mm, finding all these Alaskan ones. And I've got to ask now that you're up there. Like, they were doing wire dragging, um, depth dragging, because they were working on creating a new, um, you know, dredging for larger ships to come in. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they they do this pyramids. method called wire dragging. And doing this method off the coast of Alaska, they um, they found 26 pyramidal, one of them being 600 feet tall. Oh, gosh. Is there any mention, have you found anything about Hyperborea or extra land up to the north or anything like oh, that? Oh, yeah, they talk a ton about Hyperborea. Again, we could do a whole thing on that. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll book you in for that show then. You can do that on my channel. Um yeah, they were sending expedition after expedition to get to these islands, um, you know, north of 70 degrees. And, you know, lots of people died. Um, they talk about mm -hmm. animal migrations. And I mentioned the beasts um, that come from underground. Um, but here's that article I just mentioned here. Um, discovered by wire drag. Dangerous rocks and ship canals off the coast of Alaska revealed by sea sweepers. And is an annual report to Congress. Um, Mr. Redfield, the Secretary of Commerce, urged 200,000 to be appropriate to survey with a wire drag the more important ship canals off the coast of Alaska. Blah, 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 blah. The discovery by a coast survey party working with a wire dragging in southeastern Alaska of a pyramidal rock that rises 600 feet from the bottom to within 17 feet of the surface of the water. As it is sur 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 surrounded with water 109 fathoms deep, the chance of it being discovered with a sounding line was extremely slight. On that part of the Alaskan coast, the rock walls of the channels are nearly perpendicular, both above and below the water within 300 feet of the shore depths. So it sounds uh -huh. like a man-made wall to me. And yeah, from 120 to 600 feet are not unusual. Wire drag surveys of these waters, which are the main th thoroughfares of the popular inside passage, have already revealed 21 dangerous rock pinnacles. 
So 21 pyramidals, and the largest being 600 feet, 17 from the surface. Now, they did this and, same and method off the coast and rock walls, big walk, perpendicular. Mm. Um, they've done similar surveys like this off California and um, near San near Catalina and off the coast of Santa Barbara. <clears throat> they found several pyramids uh, in the water there as well. But yeah. What are you putting up there, Luke? Sorry, Luke's picking up a picture of something. Yeah, one of those islands, one of those Channel Islands is just uh, military only. So who knows well, what's there. Yeah, and me and uh, 13th Monkey spend a lot of time exploring all of the Aleutian Islands, and all the Aleutian Islands are completely buried. There's a star fort on one of them. Um, yeah, all the way over to the Russian side, there's just buried city. You can just see this. You can just see the remnants. They're just buried. You can see it's just like a buried mm. star fort all over. You, you see it on Google Earth. Like that. There's so much of the ocean is blotted out, and it's like, why would they do that? You know, not to mention Greenland, right? Yeah. So and who knows he, what's going on there? Oh man, Greenland. Yeah, <laughs> crazy place, Greenland for sure. Um, yeah, they were finding all kinds of crazy stuff on all the uh, oceans there. Dumb fuck. And uh, the Inuit uh, of Greenland um, said that there were stone cities under the ice all over. You yeah, should right. go to Siberia. The geography there is absolutely insane. So there's a thing called the Condor Massive, which they, if you're on Wikipedia, there's like fuck all about it but it's this giant crater that's filled with platinum and they do call it a crater sometimes, but not often. And they don't really tell you how it's formed. But if you look at what, what it looks like, it looks like a giant crater or a giant volcano, uh, basically in the, you know, bang right where Tartaria is shown as being on maps. And then obviously you look around there, the geography of the area, it looks like it's been destroyed. It does raise some questions. And full of platinum. Yeah. Full of platinum. Yeah. So again, we, I could go, we're, we bounce around a lot, and I could kind of mm -hmm. bring up stuff about anything we discuss. But the mines they were finding in America would blow your mind. Um, there was a mine in the Nebraska Territory where they were building. They were bringing out over a billion dollars annually in the, in the mid 1800s. A billion dollars in the 1800s. Um, they find diamond mines. There are diamond mines in America. Now you look that up today and they'll say no diamond mines exist. They have diamond mines in Arkansas. They had diamond mines in Missouri. Um, really incredible mining was done here in America on an insane scale, let alone the copper mines around the Great Lakes, which are oh, yeah, absolutely yeah. mind-blowing. Copper in Michigan, I've, I've done quite a bit on this because it comes up in, um, like in our history with like the Welsh meeting the Indians and stuff over in America. And they, oh, yeah. Yeah, and they supposedly had these mines. Uh, you know where they were bringing out copper and they were wearing it and stuff so. yeah the phoenicians um the etruscans yeah. and again the etruscans trace the roots the mexican race are the phenotype have etruscan overlays so the phoenicians were here i've talked about this a ton um they find uh copper because you can trace um the copper the metal has a signature they found michigan um, great lakes copper all around the whole world, all over. Tons of it in wow. Europe, tons of it in North Africa, tons of it in Spain, Portugal. So we're dealing with an advanced culture that was trading all over the world. Yeah, and not only that, they were, they had a metal, metallurgy. They could harden copper, which we still don't know how they did. We still don't have the technology to make copper, hardened copper like they did. Mm. So, and they had a special kind of brass, well, at least the old bells I've, I've heard were made of a certain brass alloy that we can't make anymore. Yeah, they're, they so lose a lot of stuff, don't they? Can't get yeah. to the moon anymore. The mining is crazy. We could, again, we could just do a whole show on mining because I have hundreds on mines. Um, they were finding huge, huge mines, unbelievable scale, here abandoned in the 1800s. Well, I mean, you know. Talking about the Etruscan language, that well, Etruscan people there. Um, the ancient British language, which is Colburn, actually comes from Etruscan. So if you take Colburn and go over to around there, you can use it to decode. Like one of the stones, this is how they know about the tribes of Israel. One of the stones uh, on Lemnos is inscribed with Etruscan. <laughs> that, you know, we're going from here to Britain. And if you use Colburn, you can decode it. So they're obviously the same language, which means the ancient British people are the ancient Etruscans. Yeah. So, yeah, and the Etruscans are the Phoenicians, which are the Finnish, and you find them all over America. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's nuts how all over. So, who were the, 
if you use that language, sorry, 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 if you use that language, you can decode Egyptian hieroglyphs. If you use Colbrun with Welsh and stuff like that, you can actually decode Egyptian hieroglyphs more accurately than like what mainstream like academia will say you can. Yeah. Yeah. And I've done a ton on this with uh, Old World Florida. We've really, um, language is one of my passions, has been for years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Phoenician is Finnish and you can, the symbols and the, the, the runes and the runic, um, they all go back to symbols. And if you go back far enough, the symbols are almost all identical through all of these languages that crop up out of these same um, symbols. And yeah, Welsh is amazing. There were Welsh Indians here. Um, the Welsh and Basque connection. Yeah. Um, the the Mi'kmaq, Mic and Mac Indians of America, their language is almost identical with Egyptian hieroglyphics. And they were trading openly with the Basque people. So yeah, it's if you like language, you should look up this channel on YouTube. It's only a small channel. Unfortunately, the guy that runs it actually passed away last year, but it's called Britain's Hidden History Ross. And he mm. wrote a book called Comroglyphics, where he'll teach you to actually decode hieroglyphs using Welsh. And then you can literally just look at any hieroglyphs and work out exactly what it says. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, I mean Get that out if you're interested. A lot of the Aboriginal, you know, um rune runic language is Phoenician and Etruscan. And uh, yeah, you can call it the mer merchant language. You know, they came up with yeah. a, uh -huh. an alphabet and a language cool. that they could teach people. Again, so many of these cultures talk about advanced sailors coming and teaching them astrology mm. and language, teaching mm. them time, calendars, and you can trace it all back to these same things. And um, mm. the box saga does a great job of kind of enveloping all of these stories these mythologies into one consensus and that's why i mentioned earlier the kalevala which was a big inspiration for tolkien and a lot of the languages tolkien invented are based on these runic languages that we're talking about now with just a little his own little twist on them but yeah so it's crazy there's it you can trace so much back to one source and what that source is exactly i don't know but it, it's one one or two groups of people and language yeah, it's it's the survivors out. of the last reset yeah, and they're based off the survivors of the reset before that yeah. and then the one before that and the one before that is yeah. what it is right like they, it's what it seems to be and that it's that each one was a one macro size larger or one micro size smaller um from the what was there before and why we have in the Bible and all the ancient texts, it, there was giants in those days, and why there was megafauna in those days of the last ice age, when it was probably more a vapor canopy, like you were saying yeah, at the beginning of this bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and all in Atlantis um, has many um, roots in different languages, but one of my favorites, it's, is alt, alt, the land without ice, alt land east. Um, and that during oh one of these resets, I like it was that. an ice age. And, um, part of what I've done with old world Florida is we've shown that the Gulf stream, um, at least in my opinion is man-made and it was created yeah, and that yeah, they, yeah. they constructed the shape of Florida, Cuba, and the Yucatan to channel this Gulf Stream into the Mediterranean and the Baltic and around so, it as an uh, Dutch route. sense uh, who was supposed to be here to, right now, but sadly uh, prayers to his uncle who just passed uh, last night and why he's not. Uh, but he will be with us uh, either in 12 hours or uh, this weekend for the 48 hour stream. And he's found undeniable just everywhere. These massive, macro uh scale size of building that like you're describing for those that are just hearing these ideas for a first time mm. it's like no it seems like literally our entire realm has been macro size okay. of mm. a block uh whatever that block game is minecraft man. minecraft it there we go minecraft world and, and jay-z dreamers i emailed you the link for this uh live right now if you want to join in as in also kuru Aha, I bo emailed both of you lovely, beautiful souls the link in your emails to join if you'd like to. If not, no worries. 
Ben. Yeah, the framer and the shaper. Uh, well said, Grimo. Yeah, um, I've been throwing this idea around for a long time that you know we find proof of ancient mining on a massive scale. Um, you know, bodies of water like the Caspian and the Black Sea show pretty undeniable evidence of being mining pits. And the Great Lakes show a lot of this evidence as well. And yeah, it's it can be a hard thing to wrap your mind around. But but yeah, the, the Gulf Stream is, is man-made and channeled that way because um, these ice ages happen more often than we think. And the Gulf Stream keeps an open channel between the Mediterranean, Britain, Ireland, and the Baltic with uh, with Middle America in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's why, as Old World Florida has postulated that Florida was a remnant of Atlantis or a, um, a port of Atlantis, and there is undeniable proof that it was a port for some incredibly large ships. Um, I have some articles, again, from Alaska. The largest ship ever found, um, Old World ship, was found in Alaska. It was completely petrified, and it was 1,200 feet long. So you wow. can imagine what kind of culture was building 1,200 foot long ships. And that kind of correlates with some of the giant stone anchors that have been found in Florida. Um, you know, mm. 5,000 to 10,000 pound stone anchors, even more than that, um, would take some gigantic people to lift and drop, and they would be supporting a ship anywhere from 600 to 1,000 feet long. Um, there's dredging to support this dredging um, mm. in the Gulf of Mexico that shows um, they would fit a ship in that range easily. So have yeah. you have you read the Smoky God? Oh, I love the Smoky God. I have a lot yeah. of articles that correlate with the Smoky God. Um, yeah, because they describe the big ships, don't the giants on on these huge ships. Yeah, um, I just did an interview um, with uh, the Higher Side Chats. If anyone's familiar. Um, it'll be out soon. Absolutely great work by, with them. Long time, well-established. Yeah, great I, I, it, was, uh, it was humbling. He's one of my favorite podcasts of all time. So I was pretty happy. Um, that'll be out here in like the next week. And in that we go over my smoky God article is oh, an article cool. from Colorado is one of my favorite subterranean articles. It's awesome. pretty mind blowing. So I read that on the show. So stay tuned nice. for that. All right, but yeah, cheers. so I gotta get the kids up and fed and off to school. So I love yes, you guys. Well, thank you for thank the opportunity. You so much for joining us. Yeah, and Campbell, you know, anytime we'll we'll plan the next one out, and you can kind of give me a, an outline. Well, I, so that, before you go, idea. right now, quickly, um, this weekend, 30, 20, 48 hour stream. Uh, Saturday is it that we agreed on for uh, doing the alternative history for the twelve or twenty four hours of it um you are more than welcome back for that we're gonna have to have you and we'll try to get maybe juan and uh uh also old world on with us as well as paul cook and yourself uh ben or at least at some point in that 48 hour to do another big one and uh kurumo ahu if you want to join us right now uh brother i emailed you the link to this exact uh stream right now and jay-z jay dreamers is also about to join us um analog and before you yes, leave ben, uh, i'm you definitely into it i want to do anything on the north arctic that kind of stuff sure yeah Let's we're gonna talk about animal migrations and how once you get past a certain latitude all the animals go north they don't go south ah i've heard something about that okay so yeah fossil records um, but yeah, tie it in, tie it into the box it, saga as well. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Awesome. Mike, okay, so we'll have a good day. Before you take off, Ben, do you time. want me to end it on your channel right now, or do you want uh, us to keep going uh, with yeah. everything that? Yeah, keeps you can going. end it on my channel because I don't know. End it. Okay. Yeah. And thanks uh, again, guys. I really appreciate it. There's never uh, enough time. There's so much we could talk about, but yeah. Yes, That's for sure. Much love, Ben. Love you, Mike. Love you, Mike. See you soon. Cheers, Have mate. Day. See you. Have a great day. Take care, Ben. All right. And so we had Thirteenth Monkey sneak in, and we haven't really said hello. Hello. Yeah. Monkey. Hello. 
Well, yeah, just mind. now. I'm we still figuring out some audio microphone. issues, and I don't have a webcam, so sorry. Ah, we still have oh. your beautiful voice. That's all we need. You sound good. Mm. It's a little bit low. If you've got a volume you can turn off. You can put up but a you'll have to describe yourself to the audience now because there's no camera. And we've yeah, got I, Luke. I, I, I tried doing a picture thing, but that doesn't seem to. Doesn't want to do it either. Oh, well, doesn't want to work right. either. We shall get by. I'm tired. So who wants to take the floor? Who's got something they want to share with the audience to blow their mind out of their ears? <laughs> 